our next speaker is Dr. Ryoji Morezani, um, who's a physician scientist at um, Mass General and Harvard Medical School. Um, he is an expert in creating uh, organoids differentiated from iPS cells for kidney disease study and drug discovery. Um, I do want to thank Dr. Marzani for uh, giving the talk just ahead of a very long uh, international trip. His title is Maturing Kidney Organoids for Disease Modeling and Regenerative Medicine. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So yeah, first of all, yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation today. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about the kidney organoids and how we can further mature and how we can use this new tool for the disease studies. So, so this is a disclosure slide. And so in, in 2007, um, Dr. Yamanaka invented the iPS technologies uh, in the human cells. And in, in this year, I, I actually went into the uh, uh, graduate school, then I started my basic research. So then we, we chose to work on the IPS uh, uh, research. And uh, at that time, I, I, I was a nephrologist uh, in Japan. So we, we decided to you know, uh, work on the differentiation into the kidney lineage. So, um, but the kidney is, quite complex organ. So each kidney has uh, roughly 1 million nephrons uh, functional unit. And in this slide, um, one nephron is shown here. But even in each nephron, uh, there are so many different cell types. And the first uh, portion is, is glomerulus, and which is responsible for the blood filtration. Then after that, those primitive urine goes through the, uh, the tubular cells and the 99% of the, uh, the, the nutrients and water will be reabsorbed uh, through these tubules. So uh, this is very complex organ and it's highly vascularized. But at that time, uh, we decided to uh, focus on the progenitor population of these nephrons. So the progenitor of nephron were identified by uh, Dr. Kobayashi and McMahon uh, in 2008. So this is the uh, cross section of, uh, of mouse embryonic kidney, but in, in the mouse uh, in an embryonic stage, uh, there are nephron progenitor cells in, in, in that express 62. So these 62 expressing progenitor cells can differentiate into the segmented nephrons uh, from podocyte to the distal tubules. So theoretically, if we induce this nephron progenitor populations uh, from iPS cells, uh, we can generate these segmented nephron structures. So uh, we developed the protocol uh, from human ES and iPS cells into the, these nephron progenitor cells. So this is a, a simple three-step protocol, uh, but first we activate the wind signal by using a uh, carrier, but then uh, we posteriorize uh, these cells to in the intermediate mesoderm population by using activin. Then after that, uh, using FGF9, uh, we can induce the, the nephron progenitor cells. So this image shows the, uh, the differentiated nephron progenitor cells uh, that express uh, 6 2 sar one wt one pax 2 uh, Many of these uh, transcription factors are expressed in the nephron progenitor cells in the in vivo uh, embryonic kidneys. And by adjusting this first step, the carrier, uh, we sometimes add the BMP4 inhibitor, depending on the cell line. But adjusting, uh, by adjusting these uh, signals, uh, we can increase the efficiency uh, up to uh, nearly 90% from different uh, IPS lines or ES lines. So these induced nephron progenitor cells uh, has, uh, has the ability to further differentiate into the nephron epithelial cells. So to promote the epithelialization, 
uh, we simulated uh, the signal uh, 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 sig signals uh, from the ureteric part lineage. It's another uh, um, kidney lineage cell types. But essentially, we added FGF9 and the carrier. Then you can see uh, there are more uh, some uh, LHX1 positive structures in, in this well. But these uh, structures uh, look like this, you know, forming around vesicle like structures. And they are surrounded by the basement membrane, lamina. So these are uh, earliest stage of the nephron epithelial cells uh, called Rena vesicles. So after the induction of the, these Rena vesicles, uh, these ne uh, early nephron cells can uh, further differentiate into the segmented nephrons. So the, this is one cross section of the uh, kidney organoids uh, made in the 96 well culture plate. But you can see there are multiple epithelial structures in, in, in this one organoid. And if we look at the each nephron uh, structure uh, closely, you can recognize the segmented structures uh, from glomer glomerulus to proximal tubule and distal uh, nephron. So these organoid podocytes uh, express uh, multiple uh, genes, uh, WT1 and nephrin, uh, showing the characteristics of the, the podocyte. And the, the tubular segment, uh, uh, proximal tubular segment, express uh, one of the functional uh, water channel, acropolin uh, one. So, this uh, slide shows the, uh, the native human kidney on the left side. On the right side, we have cross section of one uh, organoid, but you can see uh, some similarities between these native kidney and organoids. Uh, you can see multiple exterior structures in the organoid, and as well as the, uh, uh, there are interstitial stromal cells uh, that is positive for PDGFR beta. Um, so, after uh, this uh, um, uh, work, uh, we started to work on some of the disease models for the kidney disease. Uh, one of them were uh, about chronic kidney disease. So this work was led by uh, uh, three postdocs, and, but mainly uh, Nubin Gupta. So the native kidney has capacity to self-repair after the injury. But when the injury is, is too severe or repeated, the, the tubular cells cannot self-repair and the repair can be uh, uh, maladaptive or incomplete. So these uh, uh, survived uh, tubular epithelial cells uh, secret profibrotic cytokines and stimulate the surrounding uh, interstitial cells, including pericyte and the fibroblast. And those cells will transdifferentiate into the myofibroblast and the forms the, uh, uh, the fibrotic tissues. So we thought you know, the organoid uh, might be capable of, uh, of modeling this uh, multicellular uh, disease. So first of all, we checked the uh, maturation status of the kidney organoids. So in the area work, the organoid, uh, kidney organoids was uh, thought to be uh, quite immature, uh, corresponding to the first trimester of the human embryonic kidney. But by simply extending the culture period uh, up to seven weeks, uh, we actually find the uh, dramatic uh, changes in the gene expression. So in the later stage, the kidney developmental genes are suppressed. At the same time, uh, many uh, adult uh, specific genes of the proximal or podocyte epithelial cells are, uh, are increasingly expressed in the later time point. So we, we, we can see some uh, maturation trend. And then uh, after seven weeks of the culture, uh, we wanted to make sure the, the nephron epithelial cells are still, uh, still viable. So you can see this uh, 3D organoid image uh, showing the multiple nephrons. So we can maintain these uh, exterior cells for a long time. And uh, because this organoid is relatively large, uh, up to one millimeter size, uh, we also wanted to make sure that uh, 
if there's no uh, necrotic tissue or fibrotic tissues. So this is one uh, center cross-section image, but as you can see, even at the center of the organoid, these epithelial cells are still, uh, are still surviving and alive. So then uh, to evaluate the functional maturation of the tubular epithelial cells, uh, we developed a very simple uh, method to evaluate uh, uh, tubular transport in the three-dimensional live kidney organoids. So we simply transferred these 3D organoids onto a cover slip uh, culture plate. So the organoid attaches to the plate and we can visualize by using an uh, inverted con uh, um, confocal microscope. So these are the live organoid image and to visualize the epithelial structures, uh, we tested uh, different live staining dyes and we found this WGA lectin can visualize the tubular epithelial cells in the live organoid. So you can see these uh, uh, monolayer tubular epithelial cells by this red color. And then we added uh, a dye uh, named rhodamin, uh, which is known to be uh, secreted uh, by the tubular epithelial cells. So uh, by this 20 minutes uh, live uh, imaging, you can see the transport of this rhodamine uh, from the interstitial space uh, in through the tubular epithelia and into the, uh, this tubular lumen. And after this live image, uh, we fix the organoid and, and stained for the segment markers. So in this cyan color shows the proximal tubular epithelial cells. So these live imaged tubal was actually proximal tubal cells. And then we tested some of the inhibitors uh, to, to, uh, to understand if these processes are mediated by the active transporters. So in the proximal tubal epithelial cells uh, on the apical side, uh, drug transporters are expressed and one of them are MDR1. So this MDR1 mediates the secretion of this rhodamine into the lumen. So we use the inhibitor of the, this MDR1. So by using this, you can see the accumulation of the rhodamine in the cytoplasm, but not in the lumen. And then we inhibited the uptake of this rhodamine uh, by OCT2 inhibitor. So the OCT2 is supposed to be expressed on the, uh, the outside of the, uh, the tube, the basal side. So by using this inhibitor, now you can see a uh, much uh, uh, less intensity in the cytoplasm. So here I show the actual live movie. So you can see this green dye is actually transported through these tubular epithelial cells from basal side into the lumen. So you can see the functional uh, activity of the transport in the organoid tubules. And then when we inhibited the apical transport, now the dye is stuck at the apical side of this tubular cytoplasm. So suggesting the, the MDR1 was mediating the transport in the organoid. And then uh, we inhibited the uh, basal uptake by OCT2 inhibitor. So now you see much uh, less intensity in the cytoplasm and the lumen. So suggesting the, the, these tubular cells express these two transporters and actually transporting these uh, uh, compound uh, from basal side into the lumen. So on the right side, we have quantification, but th these were statistically significant. And then um, to, to understand the, the maturation uh, through the seven weeks of culture, uh, we performed the same assays at the different time point of day 21, 35, and day 49. So in the earliest stage, day 21, uh, this secretion, uh, uh, in function was much lower than the later time point. Um, then we looked at the, uh, uh, the actual drug, drug transporter expression uh, by immunostaining 
and uh, uh, bulk RNA seq. So this MDR1 transporter uh, actually can be detected on the apical membrane, but the expression level is much lower at, the, uh, at date on day 21. But from day 35 towards day 49, you can see a more clear expression of this transport transporter uh, in the in the proximal tubules. Uh, on the other hand, the, the basal transporter named OCT2 can be detected from the early time point. So, but the, you know, these uh, functional assessment and the immunostaining for the drug transporter uh, confirms the, the longitudinal maturation of the uh, tubular uh, transport. So, because we wanted to study the tubular injury and repair, uh, we chose to use this late time point organoids, day 49, because these transporters are highly expressed. And uh, we treated kidney organoids with cisplatin uh, that is known to be uptake by OCT2. So by adding cisplatin to the organoid culture, and uh, after 24 hours, we removed the cisplatin and uh, we followed the injury and repair uh, response uh, up to one week. So after the treatment with cisplatin, uh, we can be detected, we can detect the uh, DNA damage uh, marked by gamma H2AX in the proximal tubular cells. Uh, but, but this damage is resolved after one week. And also we can see this uh, proliferative response uh, marked by K67. So the tubular cells are proliferating presumably to repair the damage. But after one week, this repair response was, uh, uh, was uh, diminished. So there is a transient activation of the cell cycle and uh, uh, repair proteins. But after one week, the, the damage was resolved. So we thought uh, these response represent the uh, uh, normal uh, repair of the tube exterior cell. And then, to induce the maladaptive repair or uh, incomplete repair that are the phenotype of the chronic kidney disease, uh, we repeated the cisplatin treatment up to five times in this experiment. And uh, we, we show the representative tubular image here. But as you can see, by repeating the cisplatin treatment, uh, these tubular uh, epithelial structures uh, became uh, fragmented after five times. Uh, consistent with the maladaptive repair phenotype. At the same time, the repairing response uh, by the cell proliferation uh, was peaked at the four times injury. Then after five times, the repair response was actually decreased. So uh, we thought after five times repeated injury, the tubular cells cannot uh, self-repair anymore. So that's the maladaptive uh, phenotype. So then we looked for the chronic kidney disease phenotype. Uh, one of them are uh, the uh, fibrosis. So this muscle trichrome staining shows uh, more fibrotic lesions after five times. At the same time, the organoid became much smaller and the, the tubular number was much, uh, 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 much fewer after five times. Uh, so that means the nephron uh, number was sig significantly decreased, and then the size became much smaller. And actually in the end of stage kidney patient, the kidney size becomes much smaller. So this is actually consistent with the uh, um, end of stage kidney disease uh, phenotype. And by immunostaining, uh, we confirmed the myofibroblast expansion in this red color after five times injury. So these ana analysis shows the uh, CKD phenotype in the kidney organoid. So to understand the uh, repair mechanism in, the, in this model, we looked at the uh, um, DNA repair gene expression uh, first by, uh, by, bar, uh, by qPCR. So we noticed uh, some of the genes are transiently upregulated. So as you can see here, uh, when we did three times injury, there are sub a significant in increase, but after five times, these genes were decreased. But some other genes uh, did not show such trend. And we realized the, you know, these transiently upregulated genes 
uh, involved in the homology directed repair of the DNA, DNA damage. So we thought maybe these HDL genes are uh, crucial for the intrinsic repair of the kidney tuber cell. So to, to uh, deeply understand the mechanism here, uh, we performed the single nuclear RNA-seq in the control and three times and five times uh, three uh, injured samples. So we can see the normal population on the left side in this UMAP, but after the injury, we, we, we detected some new clusters on the right side and we named uh, injury one, uh, injury two, and injury three clusters. So uh, by the, po uh, the population percentage, this injury cluster two uh, was uh, uh, more representing the uh, three times injury. So meaning more uh, repairing population, but injury one and three were higher after five times. So suggesting these were more uh, representing the maladaptive repair. So then we looked at the uh, HDL genes in these populations, and uh, we got the consistent results that these HDL genes are upregulated the injury cluster too. So one of them are fan D2, that's highly upregulated in, uh, in this injury cluster too. And this transient upregulation of HDL genes was also consistent in other uh, um, uh, CKD models. One of them we looked at was uh, mouse ischemic reperfusion injury. Uh, that was provided by uh, uh, Dr. Humphrey at WashU. But we did find the same trend of the transient activation of these HDL genes when the tubular cells are repairing. So then we thought if we uh, uh, activate these HDL repair mechanism, uh, maybe we can uh, prevent the progression of CKD. So uh, we, we found some molecule uh, named uh, um, uh, uh, DNA ligase 4 inhibitor. Um, so this inhibitor will inhibit the non-homologous in the joining. Uh, but also known to activate HDL DNA repair mechanism. So using this uh, inhibitor, uh, we looked at the CKD phenotype and we found alpha SMA, the myofibroblast was actually decreased. And then in this slide, uh, we looked at the, the uh, extracellular matrix deposition by collagen staining. And also we stained for the, all of the nephron segments. But with this inhibitor, uh, we did find uh, less ECM deposition, less fibrosis, and also more survived tubular epithelial cells. So in the control, uh, it's very rare to see the survived tubular epithelial cells. But the, when we use this inhibitor, you can see more survived tubular epithelial cells. So that suggests the, this inhibitor preserved the nephron epithelial cells. And lastly, to validate this finding, uh, we asked our collaborator at CEDAS uh, Sinai, uh, Dr. Yamashita. Uh, he looked at uh, multiple patient samples of the minimal change disease and the minimal change with uh, uh, AKI phenotype, acute kidney injury phenotype, and the diabetic uh, chronic kidney patient uh, with fibrotic tissues. So this funk D2, the one on the HDL gene, uh, was activated in acute kidney injury setting. But in the chronic injury setting, uh, the, the activation of this funk D2 was decreased while we still see DNA damage. So that is consistent with our, our finding in the overnight. So the next uh, section is to uh, talk about the vascularization and the maturation of the kidney organoids. So this work was done uh, in collaboration with Glistra and led by uh, two co-fast authors, uh, Kim Berif Holman and Yuvin, Yuvin Goftak. So this sh image shows one of the uh, vascularized kidney organoids uh, marked by CD31. Uh, but at that time, uh, we thought the uh, mechanical stress might be uh, critically important for the vascular formation because in the native kidney, there are many uh, much uh, blood flow and there's many vasculatures. So to develop the vessels, 
those blood flow might be crucial. So we, we asked uh, uh, Dr. Luis to create the perfusion chip by their 3D printer. So this is the actual uh, uh, image of the chip, but we can uh, attach the organoids onto this perfusion chip and we can uh, perfuse the media uh, by using peristatic pump. So by doing that, we, we were able to apply uh, some level of shear stress. Uh, it's, it's 10 times less than the native uh, kidney condition, but still uh, we did find significant change by the fluid flow. So on the right side, you see uh, many vessel formations when we applied the high uh, fluid flow. And on the bottom side, we have some quantification, but statistically these vessel formation was enhanced by, uh, by, by the fluid flow. Then uh, when we looked at these uh, vessel structures, you can see these vessel clearly forms the uh, vascular lumen. And uh, to visualize these lumen, uh, we perfused the uh, immunofluorescent uh, dye uh, here, you can see. So we marked the vessels by CD31, but you can see this dye is co-localized within these vessels. And then uh, in this movie, we visualized the live perfusion of this dye. So, oh, it's not working. Um, sorry, somehow it does not show. The, oh, yeah, it shows now. Oh. But in any case, in this live movie, so it doesn't work very well. Uh, we visualized the perfusion of this dye in the live organoid. And some, you know, some of the vessels clearly shows the, uh, the perfusion of these bees. Um, then uh, we looked at the nephron epithelial cells to see if we, if we see maturation or not. So first of all, we looked at the uh, cellular polarity in, in, in this image. On the left side, we have static control. On the right side, we have high flow conversion. But you can see the concentration of this yellow staining uh, that is the uh, LTL. Uh, it's supposed to be apically e expressed. So on the luminal side, this LTL is supposed to be expressed. And actually you can see the concentration of this dye, uh, this uh, staining and on the apical membrane uh, by flow. And we also found uh, more ciliated structures uh, by the perfusion. And by looking at the mRNA expression, uh, many of the CDRE genes and the transporters uh, are upregulated by the fluid flow. So suggesting the tubular cells were, were more matured uh, by this perfusion culture. And then we looked at the glomerular structures because the vascularization of the glomeruli is necessary for kidney function to filter the blood. So in the static conditions, it's very rare to find such a vascular invasion into the glomeruli. But when we applied the high flow, uh, we did find a, a significant increase of this vascularization in the glomeruli. And then uh, we also found the porocyte uh, genes are upregulated and also the endogenous uh, expression of VEGF was also increased. So suggesting these endogenous uh, VEGF is facilitating the vascular formation and uh, invasion into the polocyte. So this image shows a more uh, a detailed analysis in this uh, glomeruli. Um, but you can see some invasion of the vessel into this uh, glomerular clusters. And we also see more later stage uh, vessel formation that is capillary loops. You can see more complicated vessel formation in this glomeruli. And by the electron microscopy image, uh, we can detect the vas uh, vascular lumen within uh, this organoid glomeruli. And uh, when we looked at the mouse uh, uh, kidney as, as a control, we, we see some blood vessel, uh, blood cells uh, that, that's, it's, that's missing in the organoid, but we still see the in vascular lumen in the glomeruli. 
So uh, after this work, uh, we thought this new uh, organoid on the chip approach uh, could be a better uh, model for some of the kidney disease. And we continued this collaboration with RISTA and uh, th this work was uh, done by uh, three uh, members, uh, Dr. H uh, Ken Hiratsuka, uh, Tomoya Miyoshi, and, uh, and Katarina from uh, Luis Lab. But in this work, we focused on uh, one of the polycystic kidney disease, especially the recessive type. Um, so in this uh, slide, summarize the, the some difference of the patient phenotype and the existing uh, ARPKD models. So in the patient kidney, uh, the proximal tubular cells uh, do not form cysts, and most of the cysts uh, are derived from uh, actually loop of Henry, uh, distal tube, and correct, connecting and correcting that. So it's more from the distal side of the nephron. But in the existing uh, uh, mouse or rat model, these cyst forms in the proximal tubules, and using a, a human kidney organoid model, uh, there was a, a excellent paper uh, from a, one of our colleagues. But in this work also, they showed the cyst formation in the proximal tubular segment. So these phenotypes are somehow different from the patient, and we thought because uh, in the native kidney there are uh, many uh, much uh, mechanical stress because of the urinary flow and the 99% of the water is reabsorbed through the tubules. So it will go to the interstitial space. So there are uh, much fluidic uh, flow in both luminal size and even at the basal side of the tubules. So we thought these mechanical uh, signals uh, might be necessary to induce the uh, um, distal um, uh, cystic structures. So we used the same power fusion system. So we, we put the uh, organoid made from the ARPKD patient or the CRISPR mutant of the PKT1. And then we applied the fluidic shear stress by the peristatic pump. And then uh, this is the actual image. So you can see multiple organoids are attached on this one chip and we applied the fluidic shear stress uh, by perfusion uh, from day 15 of the differentiation. Uh, but you can see these uh, nephron structures in these organoids. So then after um, three weeks of the perfusion, uh, we, we recognize the substantial change in the PKHT1 uh, homozygous mutant. So you can see these dilated structures marked by CDH1 in the green color. So this CDH1 marks the distal nephrons. So these cysts are formed in the distal tubule, distal uh, connecting tubules, but in the LTL positive proximal tubular cells, you know, we don't recognize cystic dilatation. So this phenotype is consistent with the patient uh, kidney. And then without the fluid flow, even in the homozygous mutant, we did not find cystic formation. So clearly suggesting the some crucial role of these mechanical, mechanical sensing signals in this cystic formations. So just to compare to other approach to induce the cyst, we activate, we induced the cyclic AMP by, by full screen treatment. But we, with this approach, uh, we see the proximal tubular dilatations and the distal dilatation was uh, much, uh, much less uh, by the full screen. So there's a comparison on the right side. Uh, by the flow, we can induce the distal nephron dilatation, but not the proximal tubule. With full screen, we can induce proximal tubular dilatation um, somehow, but they also we did find some dilatation in the distal tubules. So full screen actually may induce some, uh, you know, some of the some, you know, the um, uh, similar signals. But we focus on the the fluid flow in this in this study. So first of all, we we looked at gene expression change. 
So when we apply the fluid flow, uh, many genes are upregulated in the in the wild type overnight, and some of the genes are downregulated. And these upregulated genes are actually classified into the CRE signals and mechanical sensing signals uh, by geotime analysis. And then um, they, when visualized the perfusion into the lumen by using the low molecular dextran. So this is like 20 minutes live image, uh, but we, we detected this low molecular uh, dextran uh, within the tubules. So suggesting in this perfusion setting, uh, there are actually some flow even in the tubular exterior cells. And then uh, to, uh, to evaluate the involvement of the primary cilia, uh, we used siRNA to knock down uh, KIF3A. So by doing that, uh, we can uh, knock down the primary cilia. So this red color shows the primary cilia in the control. But when we use this siRNA, we, we see much fewer ciliated cells. So in this setting, in the uh, ARPKD organoid, the cellular proliferation in, in the tubular cells was a significantly decreased. So suggesting this, uh, the primary cilia is also involved in the cystic formation. Then next we, we looked at the um, uh, membrane attention because we thought those free the flow is also activating uh, a membrane uh, uh, tension, uh, mem uh, uh, the, uh, the signals activated by the tension change of the membrane. So to visualize the tension membrane tension change, uh, we used the, the uh, lifetime imaging using uh, this free part TR membrane dye. So this dye is very unique because we can visualize the membrane tension by looking at the lifetime of the, this image. So this is the live image, one of the representative image of the tubules. But you can see in this green color, we, you can recognize the uh, tubular membranes. So by doing this, uh, we, we detected these motions of the tubular epithelial cells under perfusion. So you see some, some motions in, in the organoid tubules under perfusion. Then in the middle panel, uh, we show the uh, flow scent intensity, uh, that is like a regular immunoflow scent uh, images. So you see very similar uh, uh, membrane staining uh, before the perfusion and after perfusion. But when we looked at the lifetime here on the bottom side, the lifetime of this staining changes so the green color shows shorter lifetime, the red color shows longer lifetime. So after the perfusion, many of these tubular membrane became red, meaning the lifetime became longer. Uh, that it means the membrane tension was increased. So in this model, you know, we are activating some primary CDA mediated signal, but also uh, some uh, membrane tension induced uh, mechanical sensing signals. Then we, to identify the uh, uh, disease mechanism, we performed the uh, transcriptomic analysis uh, using 3D gene microarray that is a little bit more sensitive than microarray. And then uh, we had three experimental conditions. The first was flow uh, in the PKHD1 homozygous and heterozygous. Then we also tested full screen uh, condition as, as a control. And we also had just regular static condition. So by comparing the homozygous and heterozygous mutant, we identified uh, more than 300 signals that is unique to the flow condition. And then uh, by looking at the papers, uh, we found uh, nearly 200 signals were not previously reported. So then we decided uh, several targets to, to further study in this, in this paper. Uh, but essentially, uh, we, uh, we targeted uh, some of the mechanical sensing signals. And also, we targeted some of the immune uh, response as a negative control. Then 
uh, we tested inhibitors to uh, suppress these signals in this perfusion setting. So interestingly, these compounds, some of the compound suppressed the cyst formation. As you can see here, these CDH1 positive tubular cells are much uh, smaller, similar to the control. But some of the inhibitor did not suppress, um, but that was actually expected result. So this first one is uh, of course inhibitor. Uh, that is one of the uh, mechanical sensing signals. And the second compound is, is targeting RAC1. That's also the mechanical sensing signals. And then um, uh, we then uh, try to find some uh, possibilities of the repurposing of the existing drugs. So we found some of the drug can, uh, can uh, inhibit the LAC1 and the FOSS. So the r naproxen and r ketolac is isomers of the MSEP that is FDA approved. So it's somehow approved as the NSAID, but the, it's actually not used for the purpose of the NSAID. And because the, the, the action of the, these drugs are different from the NSAID. But in any case, these R isomers has uh, the inhibitory effect of the RAC1. And we also used this one, T5224, that is one of the new investigational drugs uh, developed for the rheumatoid arthritis. So using these clinically tested drugs, uh, we, we, we evaluated their therapeutic effects in this organoid on the chip model. So on the bottom side, we show the, the cellular proliferation by KA67, but these drugs actually suppress the cellular proliferation. And uh, by looking at the size of each structure, so we did 3D imaging, and 3D volumetric analysis. And the red color means larger size and the blue color means smaller size. So in the control, you see smaller tubular cells, tubular structures, but in the homozygous mutant on the floor, you see the large uh, structures. That means large dilated cyst. But when we use these uh, uh, clinically tested drugs, you see now much smaller structures. So suggesting these uh, cystic structures were uh, uh, suppressed by these treatment. Then to validate these findings, we again asked our collaborator, uh, Dr. Yamashita at Cedar Sinai. So he had um, four patients ARP, ARP KD. It's very difficult to find samples, but uh, he had these precious samples. And then he stained for RAC1 and FOS in the patient and the control sample. So we did find some significant activation of this RAC1, as you can see here in the cystic epithelial cells. But this RAC1 expression is much, uh, much lower in the, in the control, in the healthy status. And in, in the FOS is also activated in these cystic epithelial cells. And you can see some expression in the normal control, but when we quantified, we did see the significant increase of these two uh, molecules in the patient's cystic epithelial cells. So validating in our finding with these patient samples. And the last three, uh, to understand the mechanism of these drugs, uh, we looked at the uh, gene expression again. So interestingly, uh, when we compared the heterozygous and homozygous mutant, uh, we did find many of the LAC1 and the FOS downstream molecules uh, decreased in the homozygous mutant. And these genes are involved in the cytoskeleton remodeling and the negative cell cycle regulation. So meaning because these genes are, are decreased in the mutant, uh, the cell uh, cycle it cannot be uh, 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 suppressed. So then the cells are keep proliferating. That is consistent with the cystic phenotype. And on, on the right side, we have the heat map, again, confirming the down regulation of these genes that are involved in the negative cell cycle and the cy act, uh, acting cytoskeleton. So 
to confirm the effects of these drugs, uh, we tested these two uh, uh, clinically tested drugs again, and looked at the, these, the these expressions. So as you can see in the, um, the cystic condition, these genes are, are decreased, but when we treated the organoid with these drugs, the expression was recovered. So the negative cell cycle uh, genes are, are recovered and suppressing the cells as proliferation and, and uh, supporting the, uh, the cytoskeleton remodeling. So to, to confirm this results by immunostaining, uh, we stained for some of the proteins, uh, but we did find the same trend. So in the mutant uh, by flow, these genes are downregulated by the treatment of these FDA approved or uh, investigation of new drugs, uh, this protein expression was recovered. So this will, that explains uh, how these drugs work. So somehow by suppressing RAC1 and the force by using these clinically tested drugs, we, we were able to rescue the native expression of the actin cytoskeleton and a negative cell cycle regulation. So lastly, you know, it was difficult to interpret, but it was interesting finding. So I'm sharing this image. So uh, in the mutant organoid, when we applied fluid flow, somehow this uh, actin was concentrated on the apical side, as you can see here. So this seems to be one of the phenotype of the cystic epithelial cells. But, uh, the, but the, you can see the recovery of this distribution uh, by our uh, naproxen. So to summarize uh, the, this work, so we did find the activation of RAT1 and the FOS in the, in the mutant uh, PKHT or homotypous mutant. Uh, the interestingly, this RAT1 activation was uh, seen in both proximal and distal segment. Uh, I didn't explain more detail, but this was our finding. But uh, in the distal tubular segment, the force ex uh, expression was found, or overexpression was found. And this activation was not observed in the proximal tuber epithelial cell. So it seems to be these two, uh, two abnormalities in the distal segment is, is causing the uh, cystic formation. And maybe this explains why uh, the cyst only forms in the uh, distal nephrons in the patient. So to summarize this talk, so we developed the differentiation protocols of the uh, kidney organoids uh, that contains the multi-segmented nephrons and the interstitial cells and the endothelial cells. So these uh, multi-compartment kidney organoids uh, can mature over time at some level and is capable of modeling uh, injury and tubular injury and repair and help to identify the therapeutic candidates for the CKD. And by using the perfusion chip, uh, the fluid flow can enhance the maturation and the vascularization of the kidney organoids uh, in in vitro. And using the organoids on a chip model, uh, we can recapitulate the uh, patient phenotype of ARPKD and uh, supporting, uh, contributing to understand uh, the uh, disease mechanism and find the therapeutic uh, candidates. So thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. I'll ask you a question really quick. Uh, I think it's a naive question. So when you, um, you, you said when you put the uh, organoids on the chip, with the flow, you don't see the uh, proximal tubules forming cyst. Uh, do, do you have to put the organoids in there before they had cyst formation or the flow actually can correct the cyst formation? So yeah, that's a good question. So the, because this ARPKD is a uh, you know, you know, developmental disease, so we thought we should start this fluid, uh, fluidic culture from early time point. So this day, day 15 is the earliest nephron stage uh, when the renal vesicles are formed. 
And then they will start to uh, form the segmented structures from glomeruli to the tubules. So I think at that time in the in, the in vivo kidneys, the glomerular filtration will start and start to activate these uh, mechanosensing signals. So then that's why we started from the early time point. But by doing that, uh, we were able to induce uh, the distal nephron dilatation. So, another, so the question is, so what if we start from later time point? We have not tested, so I, I, I'm not sure, but the, probably I think it will, will still form the cystic uh, uh, phenotype uh, because the, the, if we just extend this culture, even in the static conditions, uh, let's say two months, then we can see some cystic dilatation. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, for the, the, the static model, you know, the, everybody used full screen and also we used full screen to activate intracellular cyclic AMP. Um, in that case, we also used the full screen, I think this one, uh, from day 14, the same, similar to the you know, renal vesicle stage. Uh, but in this case, we got proximal tubular dilatation but the distal dilatation was, was minimal. Um, yeah, maybe another thing is, you know, for the treatment part, you know, what if we use after cystic form, is it still effective or not? That part, I'm not sure because we, we didn't test it, um, but at least, you know, to prevent the cystic formation, if we can start this treatment from earlier stage, I, I, you know, in this organized system, we can prevent the cyst formation. So when you use the chip, organized on a chip for a compound screening, how many organized do you put in one chip? And how do you have to use multiple chips for one replicate? Yeah, that's also a good question. So the, I think one of the challenge of this, you know, organoid on the chip, for me, organ on the chip is that, you know, throughput is, Kind of limited, you know. It's 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 a you know large amount of wine. So we put multiple organoids in one chip. So like typically we have like more than ten organoids. Then um, we collect all of that and look at all of the the organoids one by one and get the quanti statistical quantification. We could you know have multiple independent chip. But it becomes really, you know, labor-intensive work. So we typically put multiple organoids one tip and just, you know, treat these independent organoids as replicate. But we also tested different cell line as uh, like a, to validate the finding. So we used the CRISPR mutant, but also we used the patient-derived IPS lines. And in these independent uh, experiments. Uh, we saw the same effects of the drugs. Okay. Um, there's a question um, on the chat box. It's by uh, asked by Song. Nice talk. You showed some drugs can reduce the diameter and volume of the proximal tubes. Do you know whether these drugs also increase the cell death and can change the <clears throat> normal kidney organoid differentiation process? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the before we test the treatment, uh, we tested the toxicity in the static kidney organoids. Uh, one of the, you know, our major concern was, you know, these drugs were, you know, used as an NSAID. You know, the NSAID is known to have nephrotoxicity, uh, but these drugs were actually isomers of these uh, NSAIDs. So we were not sure how much toxicity we will see. So we first tested in the kidney organoids from day 14 in early time point and looked at the uh, nephron formation and the, and the injury markers. But at the concentration we chose, uh, we did not see the toxicity effects or like the DNA damage or Kim one Also the nephron numbers were the same. So at that concentration, uh, we did see the therapeutic effects in this organoid on the chip model. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Marzain? All right. Thank you again. Thank you and much. safe travels. Yeah, thank you.
Um, we'll take a coffee break now. Uh, we'll be back at 1020.